All right, so I'm going to start off with a question. How many of you have children? Almost all of us. All right. Can any of you remember your children's first real Christmas? Now, I say first real Christmas because my oldest child was born in September. So his first Christmas, he was three months old. That wasn't Christmas. He just looked at all the lights, looked at everything going on. He didn't move much. He still in that eating, sleeping, and uh, pooping stage. He didn't really care about anything else that was going on. So his first real Christmas wasn't until the next year after he had just turned one. So, but can any of you remember your children's first real Christmas? I mean, it's exciting. So you got to take, take a picture. We get excited about that. Hannah and I were like super excited. We had the tree all decorated. We went and bought a bunch of little bitty presents and wrapped them up and thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to get up, he's going to tear into these things, and he's going to have a load of fun. And, and we didn't spend a whole lot of money. We just bought a bunch of little things in boxes or put them in bigger boxes, just something for him to open and unwrap. And we were just excited as parents, like this is going to be super, super awesome. So you have to turn on your imagination for just a minute and get this picture. I, I thought about this all day, and we don't have a TV. I started to bring the video of this. But you got to remember now, we've got our tree all lit up. we got all the decorations on it. We, Hannah and I didn't sleep hardly any the night before because it was really technically his first Christmas. Kalen slept till like 7.30 or something that morning. We had to wake him up to get him up. We get him up out of his crib. We take him in there and he's looking around like, oh, really? Well, I was all this. Wasn't nothing real excited about it. Hannah and I both had our phones out because we were going to record this awesome event that's getting ready to happen. I mean, this is memories in the making here. Kalen's going to go over there, and he's going to rip all this paper, and he's going to be so excited about all the stuff that he got. And so we go in there, and what I do for Christmas is, is I read the Christmas story, and then we open presents. We read Christmas stories, pray, and then we open presents. So I read the Christmas story to him like he cared, but I read it to him anyway, let him go. So what do you think he did? I've got it on video. It's awesome. I need to find a way to get it down here so y'all can see it. So we're all over there. Got our cameras out. We're all down. We're following around. He goes over to the tree. He starts taking the presents, and he takes one, and he stacks it on top of the other one. Then he takes another one, and he stacks it on top of that one. And then he takes one that's about the shape of a shirt box or a little bit longer, and he picks it up, and he takes it and stacks it on that one. And then he uses it as a slide. And we're like, Kayla, look, you can open the presents. And we're like taking it and we're like taking little tears on the rip, you know, ripping the paper a little bit to show him that he can tear it. Nope, I'm going to slide. <laughs> we're like, come on, you got to, you know, here, let me help you open this. There's stuff in here that you might want. Nope, I'm going to slide down that box. Literally, his second Christmas, his first real Christmas it took us about three and a half hours to have Christmas because he was not interested in opening not one thing. He did not care one bit about what was in those things. He didn't care about the gifts. He didn't care about the presents. He was just making a slide. He thought it was pretty cool that you could stack them up and you could slide down them. That's all he cared about. And this is, so amazingly enough, this is one of the themes of the book of Hebrews. It's emphasizing here to the early Jewish Christians that, that the believers that are there, that the gift that they have received in salvation, the foundation of faith in Jesus is far superior than anything else they've ever received. So many times we get a box or kids get a box and you, you've seen it happen before. We talk about it now. You'll go out and take the time and you'll pick the perfect gift out for them. And it may come in a box that's this big. And you take it and you give it to them and they take off the paper and they look at the paper and they think the paper's real awesome. And then you open the box and you take the gift out of the box and it's amazing. It's all these wonderful things. And what do they want to play with? The box. The box. And Jesus was the gift that they had received but the Hebrew Christians at this time, they were looking at all the things that were going around them, all the circumstances, all the things that had brought them to that point, and they were getting caught up 
and like the rituals, the ceremonies, the law that went along with the Mosaic law, and they were not looking at the gift that they had received. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through him also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Excuse me. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited and in more excellent than theirs. He was the ultimate gift. He was far superior than anything that they had ever learned. He was so far superior than the law. He came and fulfilled the law and set it aside. He became that substitution. He became everything that we needed. He was the gift. And the writer of Hebrews, as we go into this, this is just an introduction, as he goes into this, we're going to see over and over that these Hebrew Christians, these early Christians, were experiencing a lot of things. And the temptation for them to turn and to go back into the Judaic system, to go back into the temple, to go back into the uh, religious order that they came out of was extreme. Most of us would have just given up and said, you know what, hey, I'm just going back to the way it was. It was a lot easier back then. And you think about that, you know, here's Israel who always had done that. Think about when they were led out of Israel. What did they do? They went out out of Israel. They had been freed from all their debt. All the things that were given to them at that point in time, God was uh, feeding them out of heaven every morning. And then they look around at each other and they're like, man, we had it so much better in Egypt. We had it so much better in the bondage. And that story has rung true throughout the Bible over and over and over again. And so Hebrews is one of these books that God has written through his people that are, is an encouragement. Letting them know step by step by step what God has done for them. Who Jesus Christ was. What he paid for them. And then in encouraging them to continue to walk by faith and to continue to keep their eyes on Jesus. So let me just give you a little bit of historical context in this introduction. Bible scholars believe that this book was written between A.D. 59 and A.D. 65. It is not certain, it is not for certain when this book was written. It's one of the uncertainties, one of the questions that people have about the book of Hebrews. But many historians believe that both Paul and Peter were killed during the reign of Nero in either A.D. 64 or A.D. 65. Still not sure about that date either, but they think that that's when they were killed. And if you're one of these people that believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but if you're one of those people that believe that the Apostle Paul wrote that book, then you can understand why they say that the book was at the latest written by 65 AD. Because if he was passed by 65 AD, then he couldn't have written the book. So they attribute it somewhere between 59 AD and 65 AD. Paul, in AD 58, was in prison in Rome. And during that time, he was being transferred back and forth, and they think that somewhere around A.D. 59 or A.D. 60 was when he was released. So there's where the start date comes for that. It is possible that it was later, but because there is no mention in this book of the destruction of the great temple of Jerusalem, we certainly would think that this letter was not written after the year A.D. 70. This book, the book of Hebrews, starts talking about how you know, Jesus is much greater than the law, and he's much greater than the temple. He's great, much greater than the uh, angels. He's a better way, a better covenant, and all these things. And at the time period, if this was written in that time period, it would have made perfect sense because the temple was still standing. That was the Jews' point of reference. This is where we make our sacrifices. This is where we do our rituals. This is where we do all these things. This is our place of worship. And you would think that if, Something would have happened after AD 70 because in AD 70 is when the general Titus came in from Rome and completely destroyed Jerusalem and completely destroyed the temple. So we have to think, that's why historians think that this letter was not written past 69 AD or AD 69 because Paul or somebody would have mentioned 
the fact that the temple had been destroyed. There would have been a different context probably to the book of Hebrews if that instance had already happened. I think it is important to remember that since much of the writing has to do with how superior Jesus is to anything that Judaism and its ceremonial practice and rules had to offer, it only makes sense that if the temple had been destroyed, then those trying to persecute the believers or Jews would have not had any basis for any of their arguments. If they didn't have a place to do their sacrifices, if they didn't have a place, if Rome hadn't come in and destroyed the temple, if they didn't have a place to do all these things, then their arguments about, hey, we've got a better way. Hey, you're being punished because you're outside of us. Hey, you're doing all these things. It wouldn't have made any sense. There wouldn't have been any basis whatsoever. So again, I tend to agree from the studying that I've done that it's between these years. AD 59 and AD 65 was probably when the book of Hebrews was written. And if this epistle was written during the time that we mentioned, that would place us somewhere 30 years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I think that is important because it means there's been some considerable time that has passed since that life-changing event happened. 30 years has now passed. It's no longer the hotbed topic going on in all the world. They're not talking about Jesus going in and healing people and and usurping the the Roman army. There's no longer talk about that. There's no longer talk about Jesus being crucified because you know that event happened. People were talking about it left and right. And if the resurrection happened, if people were talking about the resurrection, we're 30 years past that point. People have stopped talking about certain things. It wasn't the hot bad thing. If Facebook would have been there, it wouldn't have been a trending topic on Facebook. They'd have been talking about something else that was going on. Things were not so easy for those people that professed to be a follower of Jesus Christ at this time. Think about it. A large number of people accepting Jesus as their Messiah were Jewish. Unlike the Gentiles who did not have any true knowledge of one God and worshipped all kinds of things, the Jews had an established religion with its rituals and ceremonies, an established place of order where they did their worship. Everything was ingrained in their system. It was something they were trained to do from a very young age and something they carried out all through their life. So you have to think that these people who have been trained to do all this stuff, these are the same individuals that were now being called upon to forsake all the things that they had been taught, the things that had been respected throughout their whole culture, their whole generation, their whole entire forefathers. Everybody had taught them up to that point. This is how you do things. This is how you make the sacrifice. This is why you go to the temple. This is how you do It's ordered. It's ritual. It's all the ceremony that goes with it. That's a big demand for somebody that had been doing something their entire life to just one day, we're done. You no longer have to do this anymore. Not only that, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like that somebody came in the room, they heard about Jesus, they decided to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and they handed them a manual. They didn't show up and hand them a Bible. The Bible was not written at this point. The only thing that they had was still the Old Testament, which they had already been studying up to this point. And now you're asking me to do something completely different. You have to imagine that it had to be so natural for those who made that step into a saving knowledge of Jesus to want to retain or to cling to some of that stuff that they'd been practicing so long. What could be so bad? If all this thing, the law had been leading me and pointing me to Jesus Christ, then what was so bad about it? Why should I leave it? Why should I set it aside? Why should I do anything different? Acts 21.20 said, As Paul is talking to the brethren there and he said, And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads or thousands of Jews there are who have believed and they they are all zealous for the law. So there were a large amount of Jews who were taking the step of saying that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, but yet they were clinging. They were holding on to that past. They were holding on to the thing that made them Jews. They weren't letting it completely go. 
So in addition to all the culture change that was going on, all the things that now they weren't going to the synagogue to learn anymore, now they were meeting with these little home groups and the apostles were teaching them. And a lot of times they were teaching them by passing these epistles, by passing these letters into the groups is how they were learning their stuff. So things were changing. But we also have to remember at this time there was a complete increase in persecution not just coming from Rome, but also coming from the old regime, coming from those Judaizers, and mainly coming from Paul. Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says that now Saul was consenting to his death, talking about Stephen, and at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So here's Paul, the great apostle in the first part of Acts, Right after the church is established, now all this culture change is going on for these Jews. They've left the church. They've left these ways. But now, not only have they left that and having to adjust to that, now Paul is entering in and he's killing the church. There is extreme persecution for being a follower of Christ at this time. Carries on back down into Acts 21 again. Now here's Paul again. Now he's, now he's Paul and he's talking about new converts, and he says, Now, when the seven days were almost ended, this is Acts 21, 27, that the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is a man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he's also brought Greeks into the temple and has defined, defiled this holy place. The old regime was not acceptable to this whole thing of change. They saw their income decreasing. They saw their influence decreasing. They saw these people leaving this way. And they didn't like it. Like they didn't like Jesus, they didn't like the church anymore. And so they were trying to put an end to it. Adolf Safir, a, a, Safir, a Hungarian Jew who later converted to Christianity, and then after that became a missionary back to the Jews, writes this about the persecution of the believers uh, during the Hebrews. He says, Then arose another persecution of the believers, especially directed against the Apostle Paul. Festus had died around the year 63, and under the high priest Ananias, who favored the Sadducees, the Christian Hebrews, were persecuted as transgressors of the law. Some of them were stoned to death and through this extreme punishment could not frequently inflicted uh, could not be infl uh, frequently inflicted by the Sanhedrin they were able to su subject their brethren to sufferings and reproaches which they felt keenly it was a small thing that they confiscated their goods but they banished them from the holy places hitherto they had enjoyed the privileges of devout israelites but now they were treated as unclean and apostates. And unless they gave up the faith in Jesus and forsook the assembling of themselves together, they were not allowed to enter the temple and they were banished from the altar, the sacrifice, the high priest, and the house of Jehovah. So can you see the clear picture here that them leaving the church and establishing what was called the way at the time. These little bodies that, were, that had fled out of Jerusalem that was the body of Christ now, you can see it was not easy for them to make that decision. Now we're not talking about, when you look at these, this story, we're talking about Hebrew Christians that are within range of Jerusalem because they're still talking about going to the temple. And they're still looking at the things that are in the temple. They had to be close enough to be able to see this part. But now they're being banned from entering in the things that they had practiced so long. It was not easy. They were taking their stuff. They were keeping withholding goods from them. Not doing business with them. Acting like they were unclean. And you can understand start to get a picture of why when this book starts out and when the, the going through this that it is a clear 
an authoritative and laid out approach that the author uses that's completely, absolutely necessary. He's got to show these Jews that are coming out and they're hiding and doing these things why their decision was the right decision. The author uses this, this, these clear motives, this cleared out, laid out approach for people who were obviously shaking and pro- shaken and probably emotionally wounded by the very people that were once their family, friends, and neighbors. They had walked out on the sake of Christ, and now their own family was, was not even talking to them or not even doing business. They were left by themselves. And that is exactly, if you look at that, that is an exact picture of what the enemy does in our own lives. And you can only imagine that the enemy was not ever going to miss that opportunity to try and get these believers to think that the decision to follow Christ in their faith was a mistake. It was a delusion. And after listening to their family and friend, they had to feel like they were making, they they had sinned against God. I can only sit back and imagine in my own mind what must have been going through their mind at this time. I mean, think about some of the thoughts. How could so many of my own family be wrong and I'm the only one right? I mean, how many times have we done that in our own lives? When you're looking around and you have a decision to make and you think, I'm making the right decision, but everybody else is telling you that decision's wrong. And you think to yourself, well, am I making the right choice? Am I being wise and doing what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing to walk away? Or am I making the right choice even though it doesn't seem like it's the logical choice? And are they thinking here, are all the present struggles that, that they were going through, all the things that they're going through, not just a sign from God that they were being disobedient and that, they, that God was displeased with them? We do that today. Something goes wrong in our life and we think, what did I do? Is God mad at me? And at the time, you have to remember too, when Jesus had promised that he was coming back, guys, these these people thought he was coming back then. And it had been 30 years since the crucifixion. And they're looking around like, where's he at? When's he coming back? Does he not see the pain and suffering, the things that we're going through? Can he not see his own people that chose to follow him being persecuted? Did we miss the mark here? So again, in light of all the things that were going on during this time period, you can see how important it was for God to provide his inspired word to these early believers. They needed this exhortation. They needed this story. We're going to find out, and we'll go through some of it as we go through it, that the book of Hebrews is full of Old Testament references. And I mean tons of them. It's not just like one or two. I mean, you can go through chapter by chapter, and all these things keep pointing back to Old Testament scriptures. And that was important. That was important for these guys. Like I said, these were Jews that had left, that had been trained in the book of the the Old Testament. They knew the prophets. They knew the law. They knew all these things going on. They needed to be rest assured. They needed to be taught and shown that, listen, all those things were there, but what you have is better. What you have is greater. What you have is is so important. So I don't believe it for any moment that there was any time more necessary than at that moment that they received this epistle. And I'm sure for many of the Jews and the Hebrews that were there that were considering that step of going back, that it had to be right on time. So that leads up to Russell's question. What does the book of Hebrews say about authorship? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? This is one of those things that you can go online and you can start studying. And it is a huge point of discussion about actually who wrote the book of Hebrews. And it's one of these things that people argue about all the time. And many of you, if you have an older Bible and you open up to the book of Hebrews right now, it's going to say 
in big letters, it's going to say the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. That's what it's going to say. Now, if you get a, a newer Bible, it probably doesn't say that. It probably just says the epistle of Hebrews or epistle to the Hebrews. And many of you know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you now, that the titles, the subheadings, the chapters, the verse numbers did not appear in the original manuscripts of the Bible. Those things were added by the translator to help people find where they were to study them, to help give some clarification about what they were reading so they could flip through and find what they were looking for. But in the original manuscripts, the titles, the subheadings that you see in your Bible, the chapter numbers, the verse numbers, they were not there. Those were all added by the translator. And at some point in time, during the translation of the Bible, a group of people agreed wholeheartedly that Paul was the writer of the book of Hebrews. That's why it was written there. They all got together and they all said, hey, Paul's a writer. And if you have a Bible that's got that, that's why it was printed that way. And there is a lot of evidence, and I did not, I probably could have, I, I'm going to be a little short today, Russell. Um, I probably could have put more in here about that. There was a, there's a lot of evidence that completely certainly points to the idea that Paul was probably the writer of Hebrews. But there is an absolute lot of arguments that say that someone else was the writer as well. There are claims that gives credit to Barnabas as the writer, to Luke, to Apollos, to Sylvanus, to Aquila and Priscilla, and as a matter of fact, if you can name anybody else in the New Testament, they've probably been credited with writing the book of Hebrews. And I'm not joking. There is a lot of discussion about who wrote the book of Hebrews. So here's my answer. What's the truth? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Nobody knows. No one re is really sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. So I'm not going to stand up here and give you some definitive answer who wrote the book of Hebrews because I don't have one. There's a, like I said, there's a lot of arguments in all different directions that say who wrote this and who, who didn't write this. A lot of compelling evidence. But all that compelling evidence and all those people that tell me that stuff and all this thing, nobody knows. They're just making a guess at who wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, the next question is, what is my opinion about who wrote the book of Hebrews? Ready? It doesn't matter. It does not really matter. And as we study the book of Hebrews, I really think, I really honestly think that's kind of the point. It's really kind of the point to not give authorship to anybody to write the book of Hebrews. Again, Hebrews 1 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. We have those books. We have them all titled and all named. We know who wrote them. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through all, whom also he created the world. You know who wrote the book of Hebrews? God. That's who wrote the book of Hebrews. He's speaking to us in these last days through his son. Some individual was inspired to write them down, but this book came from God. And that's my opinion. And we see that followed up in Hebrews 12.1. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You will continually to see as we go through this, the book of Hebrews continually, every time, every chapter, almost every verse is pointing you right back at Jesus Christ. That's the idea. No matter what we go through, no matter what circumstances are going on in our life, if we will keep our eyes on Christ, then we will be headed in the right direction. Again, he says he's the author 
and the finisher, the perfecter, the beginning and the end. If we will start our life just like we did the day we accepted Jesus Christ, we started our foundation with the idea that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, that he was crucified on a cross. And three days later, he was resurrected from the dead. And the life that he lived, we now have living on the inside of us. And if we will can keep our eyes pointed on him, then we will run our race exactly as he does design. And that's my intro to the book of Hebrews.